Hi, my name is John Anderson. This video is for ICS 382, Information Security at Metropolitan State University. Uh, the topic today will be Windows exploits. So exploit by definition is to make full use of and derive benefit from a resource. In our case, it's going to be the Windows operating systems. Um, some common exploits is, are buffer overflow attacks, privilege escalation, denial of service attack, cross-site scripting, DNS rebinding, and then social engineering kind of falls in all of them because most of them are going to use some sort of form of social engineering to you know, initiate that attack. Um, and then most exploits out in the wild are going to leverage Java as it's probably the most widely used technology. So a bit of history about Windows and exploits. Um, before Windows 98, Windows was having trouble getting patches out to people. Uh, they would find a security vulnerability and they would patch it, but people weren't, it was very difficult for them to get updates out. So they introduced the Windows Update Program. Um, this allowed Microsoft to push updates to users' computers. Uh, initially, users were you know, rejecting the updates and not letting them install uh, because they were thought they were malicious, thought they were viruses, they just didn't know what they were. So Microsoft made them automatic and the updates would install and the users wouldn't even have to know, they would just have to restart their computer and everything was patched for them. So we now have Patch Tuesday and it comes along every two weeks on Tuesdays. Um, it brings us a whole new batch of Windows security patches. Um, it doesn't always happen um, that long in between. Sometimes they'll push out a patch, you know, if it's an emergency, if there's a huge security vulnerability, um, they'll push out something, you know, before that time. Um, also, administrators uh, like to know that everything comes on like a set date, so they can be ready. Um, if there's a whole new bunch of patches coming and something breaks, you know, they obviously know that it was on patch Tuesday and they know how to, you know, they know to roll back everything. So why do people write these exploits? Um, the main goal is to, you know, show a vulnerability in the operating system and leverage it. Um, the purpose of doing it really varies depending on the type of hat the, the writer is wearing. Um, if they're like a black hat hacker, they're going to exploit your system to, you know, cause harm, steal information from you, stuff like that. If they're white hat, they're normally just, you know, creating a proof of concept so, you know, it can be shown to Microsoft and so they can create a patch for it. Um, and then lastly, you know, you have notoriety. You know, on either side of that, you have, you know, people want to be known for what they're able to do. So, you know, you write an exploit that's, you know, really cool. Um, you upload it on ExploitDB. Your name's out there that you wrote, you know, the exploit, and people recognize you. So, you know, the most, one of the most common is going to be the, the, uh, the buffer overflow attack. So uh, what, what's going on there is we're going we're gonna to trigger, trigger a buffer overflow somehow. We're going to find somewhere that's susceptible, an application that's susceptible to an overflow. Um, then we need to gain control over the, the EIP, which is the extended, extended instruction pointer. So, you know, that tells it where in the stack it's going to point to next. Um, and of course, we want to redirect it to point to our payload that we have injected. Um, and then we just want to make the target do what we want it to do. So the stack doesn't know that it, uh, it's calling a memory location that's full of malicious code. It just thinks that it's calling what it's supposed to, and then the, the system is owned. So here's a little breakdown of, you know, where exactly these exploits are being written for. Um, in the early part of 2013, uh, most of the attacks were directed towards Internet Explorer. Um, there's 113 vulnerabilities found in the first six months. Um, now, most of these vulnerabilities, you know, they're looking for them in Internet Explorer because Internet Explorer is an application that's found on almost every single Windows machine. And, um, you know, mostly the people who are going to be, you know, social engineer tricked into you know, clicking on something, a lot of them are going to be using Internet Explorer. Um, you can see that a little bit over 11% of the vulnerabilities were found in the operating system itself. Um, there's more data that in the second part of 2013, that number became around like 30%. So they found a few more bugs in the 
the vulnerabilities in the actual operating system itself. So it's not just Internet Explorer, but Internet Explorer is a pretty big attack vector. So Windows, well, most operating systems in general use uh, what's called DEP, and it stands for Data Execution Prevention. It's not um, just a Windows technology, but Windows uses it. Um, and so DEP pretty much just keeps track of any memory allocation that is supposed to be executable and if it's supposed to be non-executable. So, you know, you get your, you overflow your code into, you know, a different memory allocation and you try and, you try and point your, your EIP at it and try and run it, but, you know, DEP knows that code shouldn't be executing there, so it's going to, it's going to prevent it. Um, so that, that's, you know, their first attempt at stopping an overflow attack was to say, hey, you know, you can't execute code outside of this memory allocation. So this is found in all major operating systems since 2004. Um, Apple had it in their operating systems and they took it out recently uh, in their 64-bit system. So the main problem with DEP is uh, a technique called return-oriented programming. So what it does is instead of leveraging uh, malicious code in a different memory allocation, it just utilizes a it just utilizes the existing functions that are already allowed to execute in memory. So it just returns you gain control over the EIP and you just point it at an existing function that the program is already using. So you then write your exploit using just those those functions that are already allowed to exploit there. So it's a different it's a different style of programming, it's a different style of exploit writing. But you know, in the end it does the same thing. It's it's there to own the system and exploit it. So to counter this, uh, we have ASLR, which is address space location randomization. Um, and this is gonna prevent ROP. It's also gonna prevent buffer overflow attacks very effectively. Um, because it's your 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 programs are never going to execute in the same space of memory, so you're never going to be able to predict where your malicious code is going to be and where you need to point your EIP. So you could get all the way to overflowing the buffer. You could have your malicious code in there. You could point. You could have control over the EIP, but you're not going to be able to know where it is because it's in a different. It's in a random place every time. So a little bit on how it works. Um, basically just randomizes the location of executables and DLLs in memory. Uh, when an executable is loaded into memory, Windows gets the processor time step counter, or the TSC. It then shifts it by four places, performs division mod 254, and adds one. That number is then multiplied by 64. Uh, the executable is then loaded into memory at that offset, whatever that amount was calculated. Um, the result is that there are 256 possible locations that that executable could be in memory, so you're you're definitely not going to be able to predict where it's going to end up. Um, so DLLs follow a similar process, but they all share an offset that is calculated uh, when the system starts up. NT DLL is the first DLL loaded into memory on boot, and it is also going to use that same uh, offset value. Uh, basically, that value is just calculated by taking the the TSC again and doing a bit of math on it. So the next DLLs that are loaded after NT DLL, uh, an NT DLL is what controls the the kernel functions, so it has to go first. Um, so the next ones that are loaded in memory are randomly selected. You know, there's a list of DLLs that Windows needs to load on boot. Um, so after it loads the kernel DLL, it has to learn uh, load another another list of DLLs and it's going to randomize the order that it loads them in. So even if you were to, you know, find out where NT DLL was and you know base your your memory uh, offset by that, you'd never be able to predict, you know, every single other DLL that was randomly loaded in and then still be able to figure out where you need to, you know, point your buffer over a full attack. So also when new threads are created, um, they're also randomized. Windows will find 32 different locations that it can fire up that thread, and it's going to pick one randomly, um, again, based off that TSC value that it does math on. 
So yeah, ASLR definitely very effective in stopping uh, many different types of attacks. Um, the main thing you can do though to keep your machine safe is to keep it updated. Um, don't not install those updates because uh, the hackers are definitely looking for machines that are unpatched um, because they're not, they're aware of all the exploits that are out there and they've you know they've optimized the exploit to you know do as much harm as they possibly can. Um, also, don't disable DEP on your machine. Um, you can disable it as the administrator on the machine. Uh, I don't know why you'd want to disable it. Um, definitely don't do that because uh, DEP will stop the basic overflow attacks. Um, ASLR does a much better job at stopping multiple different kinds of attacks. So as long as you just don't disable things like that and you keep your machine updated, you should, you know, probably not get exploited. Thank you. Bye.